So I hope you're enjoying and learning a lot in this course so far. Now I'm going to take a little step back and look at what we as parents need to start looking at in ourselves before we move on to specific techniques. One of the first things we need to look at is to eliminate negative language from our vocabulary when helping our children. One of the best things we can do to help struggling learners, in fact, any students and ourselves, is by eliminating any negative language. So what do I mean by this? I mean, but, can't, won't, no. But is a negative word because it negates everything immediately that came before it. Can't, won't, and no are straightforward negative words. Instead, try and state anything you want to say in positive terms. Remember, the famous should. A child should be able to. Says who? Someone is ready when someone is ready. No should about it. Never try to do something. Just do it or do not. And therefore, we must never assume anything about our children or judge them for it. Now we know about learning styles and we understand whether our children are visual learners or auditory learners or possibly kinesthetic learners. What we need to look at is how we need to explain everything when talking to our children about any topic. We need to explain to them everything covering what, how, why and what if. So we need to explain what the thing is we're talking about, how it works, why it works and what if, if this or that happens. If we can cover each of these questions and have them fully answered so our children can understand in the four big questions to answer, they will far easily be able to dominate. We need to remember that doing things little and often and stacking information or learning, adding information to information they already know is going to help greatly. We need to help them to learn to pay attention or concentration. We need to help to eliminate the stress using the ecosystem. Remember everything little and often. Yes, I've said this twice because it's so important. We need to spark their interest to keep them motivated. We need to explain so they understand the topic in their representation of the world and develop their other rep systems at other times. We must build imagination. We need, obviously, to increase their level of critical thinking. This will naturally come if we follow the four key questions to answer. Remember, when we learn something new, we also need to maintain that knowledge. So this comes to repeating the work we've previously covered to make sure not that they've just learnt it, but that the access to those memories are formed properly. So if we put two things together, stacking information and repeating, following a good rule of one, 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 we do it an hour later, a day later, a week later, and a month later. Obviously, if we test it after a day and they haven't remembered, then we have to go back and look at it again. If after a week they've remembered it perfectly, we move to a month. If not, we go back and we review it again. Then, once they have not just learned, but mastered the topic at hand, when I say mastered, is they can teach it to you. Then we stack more information on top. Any new topic or subject needs to be linked to one they already know. As we've just mentioned, answering the four questions, critical thinking and stacking, there's another topic that we need to cover here. It's called chunking. We have chunking up, we have chunking down, and we have chunking sideways. So when a child possibly seems confused or doesn't really understand the topic at hand, we want to chunk up. 
Because hunters work globally, we chunk up towards the global point rather than chunking down towards its parts. When we're talking about chunking up, if a child is not understanding, we must think, what is this an example of? For what purpose is this thing we're looking at? Or what is the intention of learning this? What is this part of? If we can answer those, or our child can answer these questions, we're more likely to be able to understand the information and stack it onto something we already know of the global aspect of this situation. As we understand the information and we want to stack more parts to it, we chunk down. So, for example, if we can answer, what is this an example of? Can we talk about this more specifically? Or this is like what? Can you tell me more about this subject? For what purpose can we use this thing? What is important about this? What are the parts of this? Or can we give some examples for this? And then we also have chunking sideways. What is this like? What would we use chunking sideways for? To help find things that are relative to the topic or very similar to the topic of things the child already knows, again, to help make connections. This is a very powerful tool when we use it in studying, when we start to see our children get lost, because very quickly we can find the point where they got lost by chunking up or possibly sideways to get them back on the topic. And then, as obviously we need to learn certain parts, we can slowly chunk down towards things. Mess and organisation. What is mess? And what does it mean to be organised? Does organised mean to be neat and tidy? I can tell you from personal experience, my house is not neat and tidy. My stuff, especially the stuff I use for work, is sprung all over the table, on the floor, everywhere. And when it's like that, I know exactly where to find the piece of paper I'm looking for is. Every now and then, I get sick of looking at the mess and I tidy it up. When I do this, I cannot find anything. I'm now suddenly disorganized in tidiness and I'm organized in messiness. So a messy room of a child doesn't mean disorganized. If you tidy it up constantly, that can actually increase to disorganization. One of the parents of one of my clients quite a few years ago, he was a top executive in an international firm. He was an ADD. -er. He had this most wonderful ability to be able to leave his house in the morning in pajama bottoms and in slippers. Is this disorganized? Is this a mess? Possibly. However, how did he organize himself to solve this problem? Well, he kept shoes and extra suits in his car and in the office in the car in case he was going to a meeting. In the office, his secretary and everybody knew who he was, so if he walked in in pajamas and slippers, it really didn't matter. He will quickly get changed in his office and all done. So he had his own system of organization to solve his forgetfulness or his mess or whatever you want to call it. He organized himself in an appropriate way. So please don't think mess means disorganization. Now I just mentioned forgetfulness. I've had many clients where the parents, their biggest problem is, oh, my child's so forgetful. He's disorganized. He doesn't bring his homework home from school. I never know when he has a test. I ask him to take out the trash or feed the dog and three seconds later, he's forgotten. Remember the rule? One foot, 30 centimeters per year, looking at them in the eye when you're doing it with visual language. If the teacher in the classroom 
gives homework out and they have their back turned to the children, your child is probably going to forget the homework and even to write it down that day. How do we solve this? Well, you can try talking to the teacher. Most teachers don't even realize they're doing this and so simply by pointing it out, they will help. With some children who are more highly forgetful, well, the general rules, as we know, don't apply to hunters. So perhaps you could ask the teacher to send to you via email, a messenger, directly the homeworks. Not necessarily of that day, but of the week of the month. As time goes on, we're getting this in many places anyway because the schools are putting homework assignments online so you can already connect into them. If you don't have this yet, at the school of your child, then we can go old school, asking the teacher to send home at the beginning of the week, all the homeworks of the week, so we're all prepared. When the tests are, etc. This does not discount the child from learning how to pay attention and writing the stuff down in the homework diary, but if he or she does, then we have a backup plan. The same thing can happen when handing work in. Some children do their work, and then forget to hand their work into the teacher. Well, some teachers turn this into a really big deal. Talk to the teacher and say, this is the situation of my child. Could you please just in person remind him he needs to give you the homework there then? If the teacher says, yes, but he should be able to do this by himself. Just say, my child is not a regular child, so please don't apply the shoulds to him. Please just ask him if you want to get the homework. If you want to help my child, a simple ask, that's all I ask for. As far as feeding the dog, taking out the trash, remember one foot, 30 centimeters per year of age of the child, looking at them with eye contact, using visual language. David, can you feed the dog please? As you shout from the sofa whilst watching TV to your child who's already in the kitchen. Not gonna happen, stand up go to your child or call your child to you, eye contact, the distance appropriate, that one foot per year is a maximum distance, not a minimum distance. David, do you know where the dog food is? Yes. Can you see where it is? Can you tell me where it is? Yes, it's in the cupboard. Right, David, can you see yourself going to the kitchen, getting the dog food out, putting it in the dog's bowl? If you get a positive response from his eyes, Right, can you go do it please? These are the types of things we have to be saying. Visual language, if they're visual children, if they're auditory children, auditory language, if they're kinesthetic children, kinesthetic language. Feelings, sensations, and emotions in your language. Now, this course, is called Dyslexia Done Right. However, it does apply to all types of different hunters. At this point though, I'd like to create a few short videos to slightly individualize some very basic topics of each type of hunter. Auditory processing disorders or auditory processing problems, challenges, whatever you want to call them. With the experience I've had with auditory processing, I have found one resource that is so powerful for auditory processing. If you are on the Apple system, iPhone, iPad, you can download this tool for free. There are paid versions, but you should not need them. You should only need the free versions. Unfortunately, if you're on Android, up to date, they do not have it available. So you're either going to have to borrow someone's iPhone or iPad, or you'll have to buy the CDs from this company. This company, you will see the name, and I will provide links in the coursework. E-A-S-E, Ease. Years ago, 
This technology would cost thousands to take your children to go for this therapy. And now, thanks to technology, we can have it for free. Auditory processing. I have found 95% of children with auditory processing problems, it is to do with the frequencies of the ear. What am I talking about, the frequencies of the ear? Well, let me give you an example. There are certain people from certain countries that have a great facility for learning other languages, whilst other nations don't have this ability. So, if we look at the Europeans, generally the Romanians, the Ukrainians, the Bulgarians, the Poles, they can learn other European languages very, very quickly. And this is because the spectrum of frequencies in their own language is very wide. So then, when they go to another country whose frequencies are more reduced, and within the frequencies of their own language, they can learn these languages very quickly. If you are from a country, let's say England, where the frequencies are reduced, and you want to learn a language with frequencies that are higher up, then we are going to have a problem learning these languages. It doesn't mean to say it's impossible. It means we're going to have a problem until we increase those frequencies. Now we're not talking about the same frequencies as brainwaves, we're talking about the frequencies of the ear. When we increase these frequencies, then we can speed up the process of dissolving these challenges. So if you're a person that has always wanted to learn their language and found it very difficult, I highly advise you use this app too because it will help you. If you download the app, you will find presets. Use a different preset every day for 20 minutes to half an hour. If you listen to it, you're going to hear music being played with some funny distortions. Those distortions are the important bit. They are the frequencies being forced into the ear to open the ear up. Now this is not a miracle cure for auditory processing. However, you will notice if you pay attention a difference. I realize one of my daughters had auditory processing problems. I finally realized this when she was just about to turn four. Gave her some headphones every day, 20 minutes. The improvement in her speech, in her conversation levels, while subtle because it was a little bit every day, we went from a child that hardly ever spoke in full sentences to starting to speak more, to full sentences, to full conversations, in a matter of weeks. This is a powerful tool. I've used it with other auditory processing clients. Normally, when I get clients, they're not coming to me at three years old, they're older. So this will take longer, but you use it for 20 minutes to 30 minutes every day, changing the preset every day to get a broad range of spectrum of all the frequencies. And over a period of three to six months, there should be subtle but important processes. Now am I saying use this app and we're done? No, what I'm saying is this app will open the ear more, but then we still have to give them all the information they have missed over the years because their ear literally has not heard what it needed to hear. So we then still have to catch up all the information they missed. As I said, this has worked with about 95% of all the auditory processing that I have seen. If you read the description of the app, it also says it's good for ADHD, for ADD, fine, maybe. I've tried it for ADHD and things like that, it hasn't really worked. It has improved, for example, language learning skills of those children like it does with everybody. This app for me, the power is in auditory processing. Use it and try it. It may not have such success. As I said, 
In my experience, it's worked about 95% of the time. So that is a very high success rate. If it does, brilliant. Nice and easy, free, very powerful. For the 5% that it doesn't work for, then we might want to look using the same app, buying the professional level and going to more frequencies with the 5% of children that I've had with auditory processing and I've had to do this, I have seen improvement. Now this improvement, when I've had to use the other frequencies, has not been as great as the ones just using the preset. Possibly because the problems are slightly different or they're bigger, but there is still quite a large improvement. So please, if your children have auditory processing problems, start here. Everything else in this course is also valid, but start with this app. Every day, 20, 30 minutes, and over time, they will get better in most situations. Dyslexia, dyscalculia. Dyslexia, dyscalculia. They are problems. With dyslexia, we're talking about phonetical identification of letters and combinations of letters with the sound and the visual aspect of it, aren't we? They get letters backwards, we misspell. <sighs> okay, dyscalculia. It's the same thing, but with numbers. They have a problem adding, they have a problem multiplying, but it's basically the same thing, talking about numbers rather than letters. Okay, I see this in a very different way. When we learn numbers, when we learn letters, we learn them each individually and then we build up. We're looking at the parts before the whole. Does a baby see your lips first? Or do they see your head first? When you go on safari to the zoo, does your child, when it sees a giraffe for the first time, say, look at that animal's head, look at that animal's tail, or do they say, look at that animal? It's a very pretty colour, it's got a very fluffy tail, it's got a very big head, but we start with the whole animal. So, if our brains are built to see the whole first, do we not have to work with the whole first? And if we work with the whole first, where is this problem? The problems come from breaking things down into small parts and trying to build them up. We will look at this in more detail when we get to specific exercises on reading, our ABCs, on maths. But from now on, please bear in mind these things. Another way to look at this. If we are going to draw a tree, Obviously, to draw a tree, we're going to start with some part of the tree. When we draw that tree, are we going to draw every single little leaf exactly how we see it? Imagine those leaves are letters. Does it matter to us where that leaf is exactly? Not so much. We've all seen these t-shirts or people on Facebook posting letters, especially in English where they change letters for numbers, can you still read this? They take out double letters, they take out the silly non-phonetical nonsense. Can you still read this? Well, yeah, dyslexics can. They can still read this stuff because their brain can interpret the general information very, very quickly. And dyscalculia, it's the same with maths. So when we get to these specific exercises, please pay attention and do these exercises because dyslexia does not have to be a problem and neither does dyscalculia. ADHD. It's important to remember that there are two main categories of ADHD. Some have split this now into 12 categories and I've even seen it split into 24 categories. However, ADHD mainly has that we need to be purposefully aware of two types. These are the internal 
ADHD and the external ADHD. Generally, girls are internal HD, and generally, boys are external ADHD. But that doesn't have to be the case. What am I talking about? External ADHD. Hyperactivity, bouncing off the walls, jumping around, lots of movement. Internal ADHD. Hyperactivity in the mind. They might be sitting very quietly, but their brains are going very, very quickly, and they just disperse. They're in the clouds, they're off with the angels, however you want to say it. Internal ADHD. And this is a lot of the time why girls actually get misdiagnosed. Because people know about the common external ADHD and they're not concentrating on the internal. I've seen this happen quite a lot. Other things with the H in ADHD. Because the difference between ADD and ADHD is obviously the H. Otherwise, they're very similar. How do we work on this H? Do we do it with methamphetamines? Now, I'm not going to go into talking about drugs and medicine. Not my subject. Not an expert. All I am going to say is the long term secondary effects of methamphetamines and the like are well documented. Not the short term ones, the long term ones. So if your child is on medication or you're thinking about medicating your child with methamphetamines, please read research on the long term side effects. How do we control the H? One of the most successful ways is to not actually control it. I know this sounds ridiculous. I know this sounds a challenge. Some of the most successful hyperactive children that I have seen have been allowed to release that hyperactivity. I don't care whether it's internal or external, but they study when they're at home, on the trampoline. There are no chairs, even at the dining room table. The chairs go, you can replace it with exercise balls. You can just take the chair away so the child can come and go. I know this seems a bit wild. I know this isn't in the way we've been educated, the typical culture, sit down. But if you let them be free, obviously we have to have restrictions, but we don't punish them for doing certain things. They are not the regular child, so the regular rules cannot apply. We can manipulate the situation and guide them to where we want them to go. But giving them that freedom, we'll see other exercises. I've mentioned studying whilst jumping on the trampoline. They might be doing a handstand whilst revising vocabulary. It doesn't matter. We'll see some other techniques that are quite powerful as well at the end of the course for these things. But please realize hyperactivity is not necessarily something to be quashed. The adults that I know with hyperactivity, some of them are just absolutely amazing. I know ADHD is that what they are able to accomplish in a day would take me a week. Absolutely amazing. I know in the majority of the schools, the hyperactivity and the ADD bit are problems for the schools. But this is the point. They are problems for the schools. And therefore, from your child's point of view, the school is a problem for them. They don't mix. Is there an easy solution? What is the solution to this? I've been asked this so many times. Unfortunately, I can't give you a one-off, quick, easy answer because it doesn't exist. Try and find schools that know how to work with hyperactivity. If you're lucky enough to live in that area, if you're not, and you have the possibility of moving, then please move. Sorry, there isn't an easy answer when talking about schools and the hyperactivity. Obviously, use everything else in this video. Use, very, very importantly, the ecosystem because this can help hyperactivity 
tremendously. We have seen the brain waves and the meditation. I said, I am not hyperactive. And I'm not saying this is easy, and it does take time. I am able to go from ADD, I can click my fingers now, I've mastered these levels, and I can bring on hyperactivity at command. If I can bring on hyperactivity at command, when someone learns to discipline their mind, if I can turn it on, that means someone who has it on can turn it off. I'm not saying I can get rid of hyperactivity doing this. I'm not saying I can stay in that hyperactive state long term. I really wouldn't want to. It drives me nuts. Typical things that hyperactive children have and adults that they have very sensitive skin, they can't, can't stand to be touched, etc, etc. When I go into that hyperactive state, this all happens to me. How long can I keep it up? I can keep it up for about 15 minutes and then I've had enough. With discipline, could I extend this time? For sure, most definitely. But I wouldn't want to. Is a hyperactive person going to want to shut this off long term? I don't know. If they have the discipline, and here we are really talking about teens and adults. If they really have the motivation and they practice the skill, will they be able to shut it off for large stretches of time? It's possible. I can offer no promises there. Have clients I've had been able to shut it off for periods of time? Yes. When starting this, I find the most important time once we have mastered these different brain wave levels is to learn to shut it off right before a hyperactive person wants to go to sleep. Many hyperactive people have problems falling asleep. If we can dominate our minds for five to ten minutes to help our brains rest and fall asleep. This is a very powerful thing. Then, with time, with experience, we might be able to go longer and put it into more situations. It took me years to be able to develop this in myself. So it's not an easy tool, it's not a magic pill, but with determination, if your child has it, Again, we're talking about older children because most people asking a six-year-old to do this, they're not going to do it. Can you do it with a six-year-old? Of course you can. Western culture doesn't tend to use this type of mindset with children, so I say let them be free. If they get to a point where they want to choose to do this by themselves, then go for it. ADD. As we know, ADD is not attention deficit. With ADHD, they may have the hyperactivity, but they too don't have attention deficit. We know this because any ADD child, ADHD child, give them a PlayStation, give them high enough stimulation, they can stay stimulated and concentrated on the topic at hand for 24 hours straight without eating, without sleeping, without even going to the toilet. So it's just not true that our attention deficit. When things are boring, unstimulating, our minds wander. When we are not following and remembering that we are a global ecosystem, we have great trouble when we are not following the entire ecosystem. Everything carefully controlled. It's going to be harder to concentrate, to pay attention, to relax, to get into that parasympathetic nervous system. Everything we've talked about so far needs to be applied to ADD. What is ADD good for? 
Let's take two doctors, an emergency doctor in a hospital, a general practitioner, the doctor that sits in the office for snivelly noses and things like that. Which is the job for the ADD? A pilot or someone who works in the airport in a check-in desk? So many pilots that I've met are in fact ADD or ADHD. High stress, good stress jobs are very good for ADDs and ADHDs. There are certain jobs that are very, very, they are primed for ADDs. Schools tend not to be. This is why ADD tends to be a big problem for children and yet for adults the problem seems to disappear. We find our own organisational systems which we can do for children but because they are so controlled in a pharma regime we're going to have to work the ecosystem and we're going to have to make sure the stimulation of those endorphins are there. If an ADD follows the ecosystem well, they get enough endorphins to their brains every single day. They have the right diet. Can they markably improve in the pharma society? Most definitely. Does ADD go away? Definitely not, and we wouldn't want it to. Dyspraxia. The way to deal with dyspraxia is probably, out of all these things, the one that takes the longest. Because we have to deal with the matricity skills, I've seen a lot of people working on the fine matricity movement of the fingers and the hands, i.e. in writing and things like that before they deal with the gross matricity. Now for me, what I find works best when dealing with dyspraxia is that we must work from, again, still big to small. So if we're talking about drawing a straight line, drawing or writing letters, we need to start doing these things on a very big surface. So instead of using the fingers, we're using, for example, the shoulder. So instead of trying to draw with our fingers a little straight line on the page, we need to get a blackboard or a big piece of paper and start drawing straight parallel lines, horizontally, vertically, When we can draw consistently straight lines, then parallel lines, whether they're far apart, close together, we can then go on to other shapes. Squares, triangles, circles, etc. We can also do the alphabet, we can draw numbers, but again, still, big scales. Once we have dominated those big scales, we can then start reducing them down smaller and smaller and smaller. Also, another thing that I highly recommend is, there are lots of people that recommend similar things, but one of the things I find the best are for the fingers, to build up strength in the fingers, they are these eggs that people use that you can buy in sports shops to increase strength in the fingers. So now in the course, we finally got through the introductory period of everything we need to take into consideration. It's a lot of information. There are lots of exercises to do. Please go back through it, process it as many times as you need. Learn to introduce the stuff bit by bit. We're now going to move on to specific exercises to help in learning certain things, mainly about school.
the alphabet. Our ABCs. Before I start working with any child, I always ask the parents if the child knows the ABC. Now most of the time the parents come back saying, of course they do. Sometimes they come back saying, so-so. Occasionally I've even had the response of the parent saying, well I don't really know my ABCs, so... We all take for granted that everybody knows their ABCs. The amount of children that I've come across, the vast majority, and this could be an 8-year-old, this could be a 7-year-old, this could be a 16 or 17-year-old, and as I said, even parents, that do not know their ABC as we learn it at school. For hunters, especially dyslexics, not only do we need to learn our ABCs, we need to master our ABCs, and this is a big difference. If I ask you now to say out loud or to yourself your ABCs, the vast majority of the people are going to say a rhyme, sing a song. But if I ask you to say your alphabet with no rhythm, no rhyme, and no singing, you'll probably find it slightly harder. We've already established that hunters, and dyslexics especially, are most of the time visual people. Therefore, if we try to learn our ABCs in an auditory fashion, it doesn't work. We need to learn it visually. So how are we going to learn our ABCs visually? Well, before I get to that, we need to look at something else. And this is called sequencing. What I mean by sequencing is how long a list we can make without needing to pause. Generally, this is seven plus or minus two. So the average is seven. Some people, in the average, go as low as five. Some people can only do three. Within the average, some can go to nine. I've met many ADHDers and dyslexics who are actually in the 13s, 14s, and 15s. So how do we test this sequencing? Well, we very simply ask for a list of things. This can be, if they like soccer, a list of soccer clubs. If they like American football, a lot of American football clubs. If they like animals, a list of animals, a list of cars, it can be a list of anything. And what we need to do is listen for the first pause. This first pause is going to be normally an unconscious pause, which is going to be just a slight stop, or they could put in a breath, so it seems even more natural. And when they do this, this is the maximum point of their lists. Or sequencing and this is the number we must work with with the alphabet let's choose animals if the child goes cat dog horse um, donkey it's three if they go cat dog horse donkey mouse elephant giraffe the list is five it's that first stop when we are doing the alphabet normally we see the alphabet in one continuous long line which is a very long and difficult list to learn. If we can learn it with a rhythm or a rhyme or a song, it makes it far easier. If we're good at auditory learning, if we're not good at auditory learning, we need to learn it visually. To learn it visually, we want to use sequencing. So when we're establishing the ABC, if their sequence is three, we do lines of three, ABC. Next line, D, E, F. If it's five lines of five, if it's seven lines of seven. As the alphabet is dealing in small parts, and our brains work globally. Before we even start to attempt to learn the letters, the children need to see the letters in their full context. How do we do this? Very simply, we read a book to the child whilst the child is looking at the words. We do this over and over and over until they have a good understanding of what the letters are used for, where we find them, and they see the global text of letters. Once they see this, Hopefully, once they even start asking questions about it, this is a good time to put in the ABC. So we make these lists of three letters, or five letters, or seven letters, but we don't write them down. We make them out of plasticine or Play-Doh. And we don't help the children make their letters. I've seen lots of parents, they get the Play-Doh or the plasticine, they start rolling out little tubes for the children, to make the letters more easily. No, the children need to do this all by themselves. What we need to do is understand this is not a test or an exam. So if the child does not know their ABCs, if we're dealing with the capital letters, 
we write the capital letters out on a piece of paper. If we're dealing with lowercase letters, we write out the lowercase letters and they have it in front of them. And they can look at this as many times as they need. Ideally, we are also going to sit down with our children and we have our own ball of Play-Doh, our own ball of plasticine, and we make the letters with them so they can see exactly how we're making the letters. Now, we're not going to charge ahead and finish our alphabet in three minutes whilst they're still on their letter C. We want to go ever so slightly faster than them so they can see how to make the next letter in their ABC. Remember, if we have a child that has a low concentration rate, we might be making three letters before we take a break. Older children will obviously make them faster and we'll be able to go longer. However, an older child, I say obviously, might only be able to do five letters. That's fine. So we make the letters within their concentration and however far we get, hopefully the ideal is to get to, if their sequence is seven, we want to make or attempt to make without a pause, seven letters. Put the seven letters in a line. Let me take a break, whatever. When we come back, we've left the letters there. And even if we're not continuing that day, we might want to cover the letters so they don't dry out, but we leave them there. And then we go to the next line and we do the next sequence and the next sequence and the next sequence. And we continue to do this until the alphabet's done. Once it's done, we can pick them all up and we can start again and practice and practice and practice. As we are making the letter, we are talking about the letter. We are playing games with our children. Can you think of any animals with the sound of the letter A? So with the sound A, ah, how many animals can we think of to establish a connection between the sound and the letter? And we do this all the way through and we make the alphabet as many times as we need to. If we get to example, the letter D and the child puts the D backwards. Don't say anything. Fight the urge to tell your children they've done it incorrectly and trying to correct them. Leave it. When we finish doing the sequence, ask them to look at yours and to look at theirs and see if they can identify any differences. If they can identify it and it's the D, then they turn it around. If they can't, then we say there's a difference with this letter. Can you see the difference? And see if they, they can identify it. If they can't identify it, we'll show them. Some children won't be able to naturally identify that difference. Why is this? This is a spoon. This is a spoon. And this is a spoon. A spoon is a spoon is a spoon. So a D is a B is a P is a Q. Hence, if a spoon is a spoon is a spoon, for us to unlearn that a spoon is a spoon and relearn that a spoon isn't always a spoon can take some children quite a while to do. If they're having big problems with this, then what we can do is differentiate the letters a little more. For example, we can put a little dot of Play-Doh or Plasticine within the circle of the D and on the B, we can put a little cross on the top. This is only to help identify at the first stages and obviously we want to remove these things as soon as possible. They're only little extra aids. At the same time, another game to play when doing the ABC, because the ABC is going to take several days, several weeks, possibly even several months, that's fine. So whilst we're doing this, at other times of day, there are other games we can play with them. We can play I Spy, we can play a very good game that we need to play to help us identify is, what's the letter that comes after P? What's the letter that comes before B? What are the three letters that come before M? What are the two letters that come after K? This is where we start to learn to master the alphabet. We're not learning a sequential rhythm or a song. We are identifying the whole alphabet. Our goal is to be able to say very quickly, what is the second letter that comes after Q? And the child can tell you almost instantly. Can you say your alphabet forwards? Can you say the sounds of the letters of the alphabet forwards? Can you say the alphabet backwards? Can you say the sounds of the letters backwards? Why are we practicing frontwards and backwards and mixing? Many dyslexic children who have problems with 
spelling words if they're nearly there with the word they're trying to spell but they're making a little mistake. If you ask them to spell it backwards, a lot of the time they actually get it correct. This is because when we ask them to spell it backwards, they're actually concentrating and seeing the word in their minds, and they're not saying it, they're reading it to us backwards. And this is what we need to get with the alphabet and spelling. We'll come to spelling in another video. So when the child is, has been making the plasticine for a while, no longer looks at that piece of paper, no longer looks at yours, then we can start to test to see if they know it. When we start to test to see if they know it, we ask them to make a picture in their minds of the Play-Doh letters and to read those letters to us. We don't want them to say the alphabet, we want them to read what they can see. If we identify that they're constantly missing a letter, we go back to the Play-Doh and we make sure we put it in so they can see it clearly. When they get to a point that they know virtually the entire alphabet and they're still making one or two mistakes, then again, ask them to go backwards. If those mistakes are corrected, then we know they have the image clear in their mind. We just need to then point out that's the letter that was missing in the forward image, so make sure you can see it. Why are we making it out of Play-Doh? This is, first of all, a type of kinesthetic learning, but it's also helping them to identify how each shape is visually formed. At the same time, we're identifying the sound of the letter, and so we are actually mixing with this process, the kinesthetic learning, the visual learning, and the auditory learning together. Once we have the entire alphabet, forwards, backwards, jumping around, let's do the alphabet, but starting from the letter K. Let's do the alphabet backwards, but starting from the letter T. When they can do all this perfectly and they have mastered the alphabet, then and only then can we start to move on to spelling. Earlier I mentioned the game of I Spy. When we're starting with the alphabet, we want to play the game I Spy with sounds. I spy with my little eye something beginning with the sound k, not k, k. So they start to see the relationship between the sounds of the letters and the entire words. It's very, very important not to move on to spelling or to reading until our children have mastered the alphabet. If they're older and they're already into the should be reading, such and such already, doesn't matter. Stop that, go back, master the alphabet first. Once and only once we've mastered it, as I said, this can take a couple of days, this can take a couple of months, do we move on? We build on what we're doing. When we're doing the alphabet, remember it's little and often, working on their concentration periods, so please don't sit down and do the entire alphabet if we know they can't learn for that amount of time. When we're placing the letters, remember, we place them visually in their regular sequence amount. So when visually recording it, they're not trying to remember one huge long line. Spelling. Before we start to read, we want to learn how to spell yes and no. Because to understand that we need to spell, we need to understand the globality of the subject. Therefore, the same as with the alphabet, we want to be reading with our child whilst they're looking at the words and letters. They might be reading already. They might not be. If they're reading already, that's absolutely brilliant. And if they're not, that's fine too. Spelling actually becomes far more important when we start to write. So how do we learn to spell? We have to start seeing the words as pictures. Now we've already done the ABC in plasticine and hopefully that plasticine has nice bright colours. Most children will run out of a ball and you possibly even use different colours. Maybe you didn't. It's not that important. Now, colour does become very, very important. When we're starting to spell, 
we start to spell visual words. When I say visual words, cat, dog, table, chair, door, things that we clearly have a picture of in our minds. When we are learning to spell, we're going to need three colours. We're going to need a blue, a red, and ideally yellow. However, as yellow is difficult to see on paper, we'll change it for green. If your child has three colours that they absolutely love and prefer to these, the three I just named, we can use them too. The colour in itself isn't as important as long as the contrast between the colours is clear. At the beginning, it might be the parent who's doing the writing. Ideally, when the child has enough control with a pen, then it's even better if they can do it too, but not vitally important. So what are we going to do with these colours? We're going to get pieces of paper and we're going to write on that piece of paper the word door. Take the blue, D-O, and we put a dot in blue. Then we take the red, O, R. Why have we got three colours? So when we have words that contain maybe six or seven letters, we're going to do two or three letters in one colour with the dot in that colour, another two or three letters with the dot in the next colour, and then the last couple of letters or last letter in the third colour. We write out the letters in the colours and we hold it up to their visual construct so their head stays straight and they have to look up to the right or to the left and we put it into their visual construct area. If you have forgotten about that, please go back and review the video on eye patterns and learn how to identify which one it is. And then you ask them to spell the blue, to spell the red, to spell the green. Blue, red, green. Blue, red, green. Blue, red, green. Red. Blue. Green, red, blue. Blue, green, red. We are getting them to spell just the picture that's being formed by those colours. When they can spell the blue perfectly, when they can spell the red perfectly, when they can spell the green perfectly, we can then ask them to spell the whole word, say the word, and ask them to spell it backwards. If the word is table, we then ask them to see a table and place this word under or above or inside or behind or in front with these colours on their image of a table. Now, we want to do at the beginning this for the amount of time they can concentrate. If it's a word a day, it's a word a day. If it's three words, it's three words. If it's five words, it's five words. Normally, I try not to go beyond five. However, if we have a child that their sequencing is a 13, we might go up to seven or eight. If we manage to do five words a day, over time, we're going to build up very, very, very quickly the amount of words in this skill. A common question I'm asked by parents, but how do we place the dot? Where do we split up the colors? Should we do it phonetically? No, we do not do it phonetically. The vast majority of children that have, especially this, the dyslexics, that have a problem with spelling that I have seen have been through phonetical learning systems and it's messed them up terribly. So we do not identify the phonemes and the sounds joining together. What we can do is over time, not at the beginning, over time, we can start to place common patterns together. When, what, we can place the WH together in the same colour. As the child starts to write their own letters, which is far more powerful than when the parents do it, you will naturally see over time, the more words we do, they will start to naturally subconsciously process this information and create the phonetical sounds together. We don't give it to them. They will give it to us. I have not seen a child that doing this system, over time, they get to a point where they start doing this naturally. 
when we start to see them doing this naturally, we don't point it out, we can just be happy that their subconscious is processing these things naturally. So how long do we have to do this for? And we've only talked about visual words. As I said, we start to do this with visual words. We're doing three words a day, following the one, 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 one rule. So whatever words we've been looking at that day, an hour later, we go over them again. The next day, we review those words before moving on. If they get them right, we put them in the pile so we can review them at the end of the week. Again, they get reviewed at the end of the month. If they don't get it right the next day, we don't move on with more words until those three words have been mastered. We just stay with the same words. We can write them out again on another piece of paper and we go through it again. If we get to three days and they have nine words and they start to muddle up, take a step back, go back to three, they have to start to process subconsciously these patterns. It's not about learning as many words as possible at the beginning. It's about changing the way we see and read to spell, not say, see and read the images we're forming in our minds. Over time, we will start to build up words. When we have somewhere between 100 and 220 visual words processed correctly, we can then move on to non-visual words. Now, what do I mean by non-visual words? I mean words that do not easily have a picture to go with them. Where, how, it. These words are not visual words because they have no picture with them, they have no image. So what we're going to do with these, we still have to create an image for these words. But we might put the word within a sentence to be able to see these words. And then we're going to have to put that word with the picture. We then continue what we're doing, building up our stack, still testing on the hour, on the day, on the week, on the month. And again, we want to go probably up to around 220, 250 non-visual words. By the time we've done this, breaking these words up naturally into their phonetical groups or into common words, the CH together, the TH together in the same colors, never breaking them up. By this time, the unconscious mind should be able to process this. So this isn't a tool that we're gonna to have to be doing forever and a day. It's until our subconscious mind has learned to process words like this. In time, we will see that when they're reading and they get a new word, they can automatically and instantly break the word up in these patterns, in their imagination, give it a picture, and boom, we've got a new word in our head. So obviously, if we come across a new word when reading, and we don't know what that word is, we need to stop, we need to make a clear picture, help them make a clear picture for that word, and we need to use that word. Ideally, when reading, they're not going to encounter any words they've never encountered before. I know in many schools, they like to push new words through reading. For hunters, we need to use the word before we see it. We need the context before the part. And this is how we learn to spell. How long is it going to take? Depends how many times a day you practice it. It depends on the concentration level of your children. It depends on how well they make the images in their head. It depends on how well their imagination works. Because I said table. They make an image of a table and they put these letters underneath. How do we make the image of that table? It can either be a table, for example, one they sit at every day because that has a very definite and strong emotional response in their system. If it's the table they eat breakfast at every day or lunch at every day. If it's a word they don't have a clear emotional contact to, i.e. the table they eat at every day, we need to make this image fun, silly, stupid, entertaining, humorous, as lively as possible, because emotions are also very important in getting memory responses. We can all walk past a baker, get the smell of bread, and boom, bread. 
So if we can establish emotional responses to the table, make it pink, make it purple, make it made of metal with spikes coming out of it, however we want to, but to make the memory memorable. So if they're not remembering these words and they're not remembering the spelling, make sure we've got a really clear picture. If we find that they're still having problems with these letters, yet they've mastered their alphabet, and if they haven't mastered their alphabet, we're not doing this exercise. They're still not getting it. When they make the images in their head, ask them to turn the two-dimensional image of the letters into three-dimensional Play-Doh letters. It can be Play-Doh, it can be balloons, it can be made out of cats, if that helps to make it more memorable. A lot of people work better with 3D images than 2D images. So use this once they've mastered the ABCs, once they can say it forwards and backwards smoothly with no unnatural long pauses, building up a library, a visual library of words. When we ask them to spell a word, they must see it in their heads and they must read the word. Ask them to read you the colors of the words from memory. If they start to have trouble with a word, we will also know the colors of each word. So we can ask them, let's say the word is giraffe and they're getting stuck in the middle. If the middle is in green, say, those are the green letters. What were the green letters of the word giraffe? To help them see the word. If it's still not clear, go back to the paper. If the paper still isn't helping them, we can go back to the Play-Doh and we can do exactly the same thing, making in the three colors out of Play-Doh to give them that three-dimensional image directly. Play around as your child needs to play around with it. For most people, writing on the piece of paper will be powerful enough. If you find it's not, use the Play-Doh. And over time, building up the words, building up the system of learning to spell, building the unconscious visual system of learning to spell, it will become natural. Reading. English is only about 80% phonetical. So when we start to read, we obviously want to start to read with books that the words are phonetical. We're not identifying the phonetics. It's simply a matter of learning to process to mix between the sounds of the words that have already been learned with the plasticine that we're already seeing in the three colors to put them together as a whole so we can see a word. Those words, we do not want to sound out. If the child, when reading a book, tries to sound out a word, which is the way everyone was taught and is still being taught. If they have trouble with a word, just say the entire word. They can repeat it or not. You move on to the next word. Say the entire word. We want to learn whole word reading. Does whole word reading or visual reading take longer than sounding things out? It might do, it might not. I've seen children that have learned reading this way very, very quickly, far faster than sounding words out. I've seen others that take longer. But how long does it take to learn to sound out words? It's impossible to define this. Which takes longer, which takes shorter. What is possible to define is if we are visual learners, we need to learn to read visually. If we are whole world learners, we need to learn whole world, or in this case, whole word learning. Over time, these words will be committed to memory visually. So we need to find books that are visual with lots of pictures to be able to relate instantly the words we're talking about. They need to be phonetical words 
and they need to be highly repetitive. Now, luckily, there are many, many books when learning to read like this. It shouldn't be a problem. They call them phonetical books. Great. It's not about the phonetics for us. It's about the repetition. It's about the visual imagery. As I said, when there's a word they're not sure about, just say the whole word. It's as simple as this. Basic reading is as simple as this. If you have to say out loud 20 words, 10 of them, do so. Or, even better, go for a more simple book. At the beginning, we're going to have to tell them every single word. If we haven't been reading with them for years before bed whilst they're looking at the words. If we've already been doing this, then you'll see you'll now be far more advanced. How long do we read for? We must sit down for 15 minutes a day and read. No, it's far better to read five words perfectly, or it's far better to read concentrating, effective reading, five words than it is three sentences struggling. As we build up, it's far better to read one sentence effectively than a paragraph in a confused, unhappy manner. Building up, it's better to read a paragraph than it is a page. And it's most important that we stop reading at their maximum point of interest to make them want more. When reading, it is a brilliant help to have old school finger under the word to clearly see the word we're reading. Sometimes a ruler is useful if the child constantly loses their place on the page, we can use a ruler. Better the finger. In some cases, it can be very advantageous to cut out a little square about the size of a word and cover the text we're reading. So we can only see one word. So they see the word, they say the word, we move on to the next one to avoid distraction. If we do this, obviously over time we're going to start speeding up. It's going to get to a point that it gets very difficult to do this. So then we go back to the finger. I know some words they're going to not quite fit in the box and others we're going to see two or three words. It's not important. It's just a guide to help see the whole word we're reading. Now over time, we get better at reading. Reading whole words, it takes as long as it takes, building with concentration, building with maximum interest. We want reading to be fun and stimulating. I know, we get reading assignments, and this helps our children to learn to dislike reading in many cases. We cannot pay attention to that. We must work on their concentration, their level of max interest, if they're putting in 100% effort for three words, then it's three words. If it's a sentence, it's a sentence. I cannot stress this enough. So over time, we start to read full sentences. We get to paragraphs. We get to pages, eventually. When we're reading, and we're reading these whole words, and we're now identifying clearly these words, at the end of the sentence, we want to stop, we want to look up, and we want to create in our minds a visual image, this can be a photo, this can be a picture, this can be a movie, of what we just read. Then we move on to the next stage and the next sentence and we do the same thing. This brings me on to reading comprehension. Children get given at school, when they're slightly older, reading comprehensions. Or we're told, with a lot of the time with many dyslexics, and ADD is, and ADHD is, that they have poor reading comprehension skills. When I talk about reading comprehension, I'm talking about the text with the questions underneath. They read the text, as they read the text, they understand the text, but yet they can't answer the questions. So my question is, hang on, they read the text and they understood the text. What's wrong with their reading comprehension? But they can't answer the questions. So they have poor reading comprehension skills. This is incorrect. If they are understanding the sentence, the words, as they read them, there is nothing wrong with their reading comprehension. If they're not understanding the words and the sentences, then either 
the level is too complex for them. And following the rule of 90% easy, 10% hard, we have to go to an easier level of reading and build up. Doesn't matter what the school's asking for, we must ask for easier texts for them from schools or simply do it ourselves and build it up from there. But if we're talking about they're understanding it as they read it, they know what they're talking about, but they can't answer the questions, we're not talking about reading comprehension. We are talking about memory retention, not comprehension. This is a huge difference. They are comprehending the information as they read it, but they're not retaining the information long enough to answer the questions. So how do we solve this? Well, I've actually already told you how to solve it. When we're reading, we read a sentence, we get to the end of the sentence, we look up. We create a picture or a video or a comic in our head and we put all the relevant information of that sentence into our image, series of images and videos. Then we move on to the next sentence. We go up to visual construct, wherever it is, and we construct it. We get to the end of the paragraph. We then finish the last sentence in visual construct. And then we go to visual recall to make sure we have the information we put in there from that paragraph. And then we can move on to the next paragraph. So we read alongside our children. We make sure they have the image at the end of the paragraph. We can then test to see what they remembered. Over time, we can build up the memory retention through visual imagery. And therefore, when we get to the questions, we can then look for the images in our heads and answer the questions. Obviously, when doing a reading comprehension, school style, it's always good to read the questions first to know exactly what the information it is we're looking for. Therefore, as we're reading through, we can highlight in our minds with brighter colors or bigger images that information. This is the secret to reading retention, not comprehension, retention. If it's reading comprehension that is the problem, that they're not understanding the text, it's because the text is too difficult for them and we must go to an easier text and build up from there. It's as simple as that. How to read a textbook. A lot of the time, an ADHD -er does not have the patience to sit down and read the 200 words in front of them of a textbook to be able to answer questions for their homework. A dyslexic, by the end of their day, their stress level is through the roof. They've gone into lazy mode, not lazy at all. They're not lazy. It's just their stress is so high, they are worn out. They do not have the attention span to be able to read this information to answer. So, first of all, make sure the ecosystem is being upheld. And then, how do we approach reading a textbook? When reading a textbook, whether it's for the homework or whether, because for an ADHD kid, we've got the information from the teachers of the homework of the week, so we're going ahead and we're looking at new information or we're revising the topic of the past few days as we're moving on to the next one. How do we read a textbook? We read the title. So we know what we're talking about. Modern textbooks have lovely bright images. So we look at the images. We see what we see in the images. We relate it to the main title. We then read the subtitles or the small titles. We refer those to the images and we can read now the little words, the sentences under those images. And we can relate it all together. We then look for the words in bold or italic and we relate that into the picture or movie we're creating in our mind of this subject, the same as reading comprehension slash retention. Once we've done this with most modern textbooks, we will already have 80% of the information we need. So with this information, without reading anything other than the pictures, the titles, 
the words in bold and italic, we can then look at the questions. We will probably find we can answer not all of the questions, but we can already answer a couple of the questions. So we go ahead and we answer them. Then, having the other questions that we need to find the answer for, we go back to the main body and reading in the style of building on the image that we've already got in our minds, we start reading. It can be even skim reading at this stage. We skim through, adding any relevant information, and we put it into our picture. Some children are very, very skilled at skim reading, and it has nothing to do with age. They can naturally do it when they've learned how to read following the system I've already explained. Others will have a slightly hard time, and that's fine. They can read normally, and they put the information into their picture, and then they can answer the questions at the end. Title, pictures, subtitles, keywords, questions, body of the text. So I said I could read at 600 words a minute. I have people who can read at 1,000. Most people read at 350. How do we do this? Once we're at the stage that we can clearly read out loud, making no mistakes, we can answer comprehensions, reading to ourselves, then we can move on to the next stage. Most people, when they read to sound out words and to read aloud, they get this little voice in their head that's literally reading to them. So the skill of reading for these people is not in fact a visual skill, it's an auditory skill. We are not processing the information visually, we're processing it auditorily. We're hearing the voice and then we understand what we're saying. But if we've processed from the very beginning, from our ABCs, how to read visually, this is where we can very, very quickly shoot ahead of other people. And we can read very effectively with about an 80% retention at 600, 1000 words a minute, instead of about a 60 to 70% retention at maximum 350 words a minute. How do we get there? Well, we turn off the little voice in our head. How do we do this? We look at the word and because we have built up a library in our head of words with pictures, we will see the word and we'll see the picture before we hear the word in our brains. So we read T-A-B-L-E. We've already got the image of a table in our head before we hear the word table. So to be able to read 600 to 1,000 words a minute, all we have to do is to turn the volume down. And we learn to read, seeing the pictures of the words at high speed. This is easily possible for visual people to see all these images flash by. And we can build up flashing these images into the context, make an image, and keep going. As we do this, we will learn that reading the its, the as's, the if's, the buts, we will learn that we don't need to visually process these words. They become less important. And so we start building on the important words. Or what some people call skim reading. We quickly identify the important words and we build them in to the non-verbal visual reading skill. I've heard many people say, this just is not possible. Well, they never learned how to do it. Therefore, that for them, it's not possible. If you suddenly try to do it, if you are an auditory reader and you suddenly try to do this, you will find it virtually impossible to do. And that's why these people claim it's not possible to do it. However, if we've learned to read in a visual manner and we have this library of whole words with their corresponding images and ultimately the sound, which is the least important part of the way we read, we can turn off that voice very easily and we can increase our speed. Now I said I can read without practice these days at about 600 words a minute. Can I read anything at 600 words a minute? No, I can't. Can I read an easy reading novel at 600 words a minute? Yes, and faster. Can I read a legal textbook 
at 600 words a minute. No. Why is this? Well, first of all, I don't understand half the terms. Second of all, when it comes to technical information and new vocabulary, a science textbook, it's going to take us longer. This is why we need, when reading textbooks, to identify the key words and know we fully understand them, along with the images and the titles, before we go and read the main body. Because therefore, if we understand these things and we've created the images of these keywords and the titles, adding to it is going to be easier and therefore we can get up to these speeds. To be able to do this, it is a process. I had to relearn the spelling system. I had to relearn how to identify my words visually. Once I did that, I could then move on and I used my finger under the words. Shum, shum, shum. And I could easily swallow 500 words a minute. I got up to about 600 words a minute. Over 600 words a minute, for me personally, I stopped practicing getting faster there because that was the speed I enjoyed to read at. More than that, I stopped enjoying it so much. And for me, for the amount I need to read, 600 words a minute is fine. If you're a university student, you might want to practice this and go up to a thousand words a minute. It is possible, it does require practice to turn off that voice once you've gone through the entire system. Numbers and maths. As dyslexics have problems coding these abstract spoons with the relative sounds. The people who do dyscalculia have the same problem with numbers. So we have to learn how to code numbers. Learning to code numbers is actually far easier than it is to learn to code letters. Why is this? What's this number? One. What's this number? Two. What's this number? Four. It's not the abstract figure that we write down of the number four or the number three. Those are abstractions. Our brains work very similar for mathematical coding to computers. Computers are built up of binary code, zeros and ones, and they can process those zeros and ones at phenomenal speeds. The human mind cannot process zeros and ones as fast as a supercomputer. However, the human brain can process more than zeros and ones. So how do we code maths? And numbers. We play games. We play games? Yes. There are two types of games we need to play to learn to code maths. Children that do this, whether they are hunters, whether they are farmers, are far more successful at maths. And they actually tend to be the 10% of people that end up enjoying maths. Because 90% of people, of adults, don't like maths. If you learn to code by playing games, this is how we can create the building blocks to successful mathematicians. So what is this code I'm talking about? Well, you've seen it a million times because there are two types of games we have to play where we see these codes. The first, on a die, or as some people miscall it, a dice. One dot, two dots, three dots, four dots, five dots, and possibly six dots. The other place we see coding is on poker cards. The one dot, the two dots, up to the ten dots. We don't need to go higher than ten dots. Actually, up to five dots. Those are placed on the dice. The way we code number six and the way we code number seven, eight and nine can vary. We can use the six of the dice. We can use the seven, eight and nine of the cards. However, 
whilst up to five was very, very cleverly designed, the others weren't. If you look at this picture, you'll see a slightly different coding. And all it is, is the repetition of one to five. Because if we can code correctly to five, to code 10 is just five twice. If we can code and five and 10, and we get that clear in our mind, we can then build, again, with plasticine, yes, with plasticine, we can then build the abstract onto our code. So our subconscious mind sees the abstract form and immediately identifies that as three dots. Three dots and two dots make five dots, five. Our brains can process this extremely quickly and therefore we can add, we can take away, we can multiply very, very quickly. Why playing games? Well, because we're seeing these patterns repeatedly, subconsciously. And I'm not talking about playing games on an iPad. I'm talking about physically rolling the dice, identifying five dots as five, and moving our counter five places. Or well, one of the most highly efficient games we can play to learn to count are games like Snakes and Ladders. Because we land on the abstract. Four. We roll the dice we see five dots, we have to move it five places. And we then put our counter on the abstract figure of nine. Now we don't have to point this out, we just have to play many, 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 many times. And subconsciously, we're always talking about subconsciously, this information is being soaked up by our brains. Playing cards. When we're playing cards, we can play Simple games like Go Fish. We can play slightly more advanced games like Blackjack, adding up to 21. Now, we can play up to 21, we can play up to 20, we can play up to 10. It doesn't matter what we're playing up to. It doesn't matter the number we're adding to per se. It's that we are coding the dots subconsciously with the number on the side of the card and we're adding them together. We're adding the dots of this card to the dots of this card, fives, building up to tens, subconsciously having fun doing it. Another way to help to code this is to get colored blocks of wood, plastic, colored counters, have several colors, five of each. And we place in the code, one counter, two counters in the diagonal, three counters in the diagonal, four in the square, five. We then go to the next color and do it again. When we ask simply that the child says how many there are. We can add two at a time, we can add three at a time, we can take away four, we can... At the beginning we might go up to 10, where the child, 90% easy, goes no problems. As we start going into the teens, it might get a little confusing, so we stop there, we come back and we identify. As they get better at maths, we might build up to 30. Where they start to get confused, we then just play up and down, picking up blocks, putting down blocks, how many there are. Obviously, we don't pick up random blocks. We leave five, five, five. We always do completes of five, and then we take off from the last complete block, or we add to the last complete block. Once we can do this smoothly, by playing the games, and we've got the coding with the abstraction, we can then start to work more with the abstraction. When we're working with the abstraction, again, we're doing simple games, the same thing. Three plus two. We want them in their brains to be seeing three dots, two dots makes five. Unconsciously. We'll know it's going to be unconscious because they're going to be doing it at rapid speeds. When they're learning, they're going to be doing it slowly, processing it consciously, and it'll take a bit more time. But we must build in this coding. When we've got this coding, the people who do maths highly effectively, this is the skill they do unconsciously. From the previous presentation of seeing those five counters, as I said, we can put, not necessarily, we can put them in ones, we can put them in twos, we can put them in threes, we can take them away in threes, we can take them away in twos. Whilst we are putting them in ones, 
This stimulates the skill of counting. As soon as we start putting them in twos, threes, fours, fives, sevens, this is stimulating the skill of adding. Counting and adding are not the same thing. They are very, very, very different skills. I have a little pet peeve when it comes to this. When talking about schools, it's the same with the reading. Whilst we're teaching our hunter children to read visually, they're getting at school, sound it out, sound it out, sound it out. So unfortunately, there is a little bit of conflict here. The same when it comes to this. My girls, before they went to school and started seeing maths, they were already adding and subtracting in threes, fours, fives, sixes. They started doing maths at school and they de-evolved back to counting on the top on their fingers. Counting and adding are very, very different skills. Counting is lineal, is auditory at the end of the day. And this is why they do it at schools. We don't want that. We want to go straight to adding and therefore subtracting. Whilst we're on the topic of adding and subtracting, this is another thing. In schools, they tend to teach that adding and subtracting are different things. Just like multiplication is different and fractions are different and decimals and percentages and everything is unrelated. Maths is a language. Everything in maths is built on the previous subject. And this is exactly how we're trying to teach our own children. So we start the coding. We can go straight into adding and subtracting. When we have the adding and subtracting, we can then go into multiplication. Now, how do we go into multiplication? There are several ways to do this. One is to use the same counters, take three reds, three blues, three yellows, put them together, and we see a square of three by three. We can quickly add these to make nine, or we can show we're timesing to make nine. The problem with this is we are breaking our code from the adding and subtracting. I personally prefer to learn multiplication by using our times tables. Now, here's a big question. Because so many dyslexics, people with dyscalculia, have problems learning their times tables. How do we learn our times tables? We can all count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. When we've learnt it, and this is counting, not adding. And this is a skill we're going to use for our times tables. The skill of counting, not adding. We're going to learn to count in ones, we're going to learn to count in twos, we're going to learn to count in threes, we're going to learn to count in fours, etc. So how are we going to do this specifically? And it is the specifics that's important. We are going to use motor memory to learn to multiply, or our times tables. How are we going to use motor memory? We're going to use our fingers. Some countries, they only need to know up to their 10 times table. We have 10 fingers. That makes it lovely and easy. Some countries require up to 12. That's fine. Luckily, we've got two feet as well. So we're going to just add the feet in for 11 and 12. We start. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And in the case, we lift a foot, 11 and 12. And then we go down. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Until we can do the ones absolutely perfectly at any time we're asked, we do not move on to counting in twos. Once we can do the ones, and if we need it written down, if the child gets stuck, give them the answer. This isn't a test whilst we're installing the information. Once we've done the ones perfectly, up and down, we then go for the twos. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 24, 22, 20, etc, etc, etc. Again, 
we must master the twos mechanically into our fingers before we move on to the next. To install it in, a, in our fingers, we must make sure we do not go two, four, or two, four, six. We must say the correct number as we lift the finger. Two, four, six. To install the number on the muscle memory. Now, if we do this and we master every single number of each of the answers of the times tables, once it's all mastered, we will be able to as if by magic, say, let's say, the six times table. So we want six times six. So we put on our thinking cap, sixes. We lift our sixth finger and the number 36 magically appears in our head. If it doesn't magically appear in our head, we have not installed this process correctly. We must practice this. Very short intervals, many, many times. So this is a game, once again, to play in the car whilst we're waiting in line. It's not something we need to do while sitting down. We can also use it as one of those change our mind tools when we're doing history homework. We take our time with this and we install it correctly. It is a very, very powerful tool to learn all the multiplications up to 12 times 12 if we need to, or 10 times 10. If we can do 10 times 10 and everything under that, we already have the vast majority of the calculations we need. Then, for further multiplications, it is a question of paper mechanics for the calculations, the long multiplications, and also we will find the division will become easier because we already have recognized many, many numbers. The paper mechanics does tend to be the standard thing we see at school, and we'll see this in another video. So then there are other things in maths. How do we go about them? Fractions, decimals, where do we learn that? Well, I've previously said in other videos, if we have taken our children into the kitchen and we have already been cooking with them for several years by the time we get to fractions and decimals, we'll already know how to do this. If we haven't, start cooking. Start cutting pizzas, start cutting cakes. A pizza goes in half, a pizza goes in quarters, Cutting, 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 cutting. Of course, we don't have to cook 10,000 pizzas to learn fractions. We can use a Play-Doh circle and we seal it and we divide it and we divide it. Same code visually the fractions and then give the abstract of a quarter. That little chunk is represented by one over four. We cut that in half and we can clearly see there are eight pieces, so it's now an eighth, one over eight. Code, first, with pizzas, with cakes in the kitchen. We can then take it to its abstract figures very, very, very easily. Once we've understood this, again, times in fractions, adding fractions, dividing fractions, we can then go to the standard principles on paper of how to work them out learn those mechanics, and if we have the original coding done correctly, and we practice the mechanics in the right way, there will be a much greater reduction in problems. Now, I'm not saying someone with this calculator is magically going to have all the problems disappear, but they are going to find it much more simple, and they are going to be able to manage that subject very well. 
just like a dyslexic person, going visual can manage well. Before we go on to multiplication and division, we want to look at another beginner maths topic. And this is telling time. How do we begin to teach telling time? Until a child can recognize today, yesterday, tomorrow, morning, afternoon, evening, we're not gonna start with telling time. Before we go on, to telling time, the specific hours of the day. We want to learn the days of the week and the months of the year. Here, I'm going to ask you to get your children to watch the movie Thor, the Marvel movie. If they've already seen it, that's great. Get them to watch it again. And whilst they're watching it and you're watching it with them, make sure they learn the names of Thor of Odin, of Freya. Now, why is this? Because we're going to use this to help us learn the days of the week. Whilst we are talking about these characters, we're going to add in Tyre as well. Tyre was the god of war, of the Nordic gods. Now, we don't have to go in that they were Nordic gods, they were simply characters in a movie if we want to. But we're going to use this to help us learn the days of the week. So once we've watched the movie, we're going to write in a circle, not in a line, in a circle, M, T, W, T, F, S, S. And then we're going to start, obviously, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On Sunday, we're gonna draw a sun because Sunday is the day of the sun. On Monday, we're going to draw a moon because Monday comes from moon day. On Tuesday, we're gonna draw a little representation of war because Tuesday comes from Tyre, which is the old god of war or the character of war. Wednesday comes from Odin, so we draw something to represent Odin. Odin, or Warden, gets turned into Wednesday. Thursday, of course, is Thor's day. Friday is Odin's wife. Friar's day, or Freya's day, however you want to call it. And then, Saturday comes from either the god or the planet, Saturn, Saturday. So as well, we want to learn the planets before the days of the week. When we know the planets and when we know these characters and we know the sun and the moon, we can build on what we already know to apply the days of the week. And this is where, in English, the days of the week actually come from. So then we have the circle with the first letters and we go around moon day, Monday, Thor's day, Thursday. We go around front ways and we go around back ways until we control the entire circle. In the middle of the circle, we're going to put an arrow and we're gonna point that arrow to each day to see which one we want. This is introducing the clock face. We're now going to do the same thing for the months of the year. Now we're not gonna give a long explanation here, but we are going to separate three months of spring, three months of summer, three months of autumn, three months of winter. So give the three months of spring, one color, the three months of summer, another color. Just the first letters in a circle, exactly like we've done with the days of the week, once the days of the week have been mastered. We put the arrow in between and we use things to help us remember. People's birthdays, Christmas, Hanukkah, depending on your religion, use it if the children know when these holidays are. And we go around front ways and back ways and we start in the middle and we learn the months of the spring and we learn the months of winter until we have all this defined. When we have this and we're used to using one arrow of the clock face on these little clocks, we can then move on to telling time. Telling time. Whilst we are learning and mastering tomorrow, today, yesterday, and the days of the week, starting with that 
circular clock face and the months of the year with the circular clock face and we're into the months of the year we've already got 12 things around the clock we want to start telling time digitally we need to give the child a digital watch with am and pm not 24 hours yet just am and pm and start asking them at every opportunity we can What's the time? We're not going to bother with quarter past, half past, ten to. We're just going to go, what's the time? It's 3.23. It's 6.22. And get them used to telling the time and the hours of the day. Once they can easily tell you the time digitally, and we've mastered the days of the week and the months of the year, forwards and backwards and starting in any place, then we can go on to telling the time on an analog clock. We're going to start with a clock with one to 12, and we're going to start with the hours, the same as the digital. Then we're gonna have another clock with just the minutes, same as the digital, and get used to reading the analog numbers like the digital format. Once we've got the hours and we've got the minutes, we can put them together. Again, it's 10.55, it's 10.45, and once they've got that, we can then go into quarters. Now, when we're going into the quarters and the halves, we want to have already, in the kitchen, practiced half a pizza, quarter of a cake, so we know exactly what a quarter means and exactly what a half means. So then, when we're explaining the quarters and the halves, we very simply show that from 12 to 6, we're cutting the cake in half. So when the big hand gets to the 6, it's half past. And then when we're talking about the 3 and the 9, we're talking about quarter past and quarter 2. How do we teach past? How do we teach 2? Well, we're going towards the hour and we've gone past the hour. Over the halfway line is where we change. If we take it step by step, mastering the times, getting used to the clock face, mastering the days of the week, the months of the year, having fully understood and mastered what is half and quarter, then when we get to the full analog clock, all we're doing is building on stuff we all ready no and combining it together multiplications and divisions how do we do multiplications and divisions we use the standard mechanical methods now which one do we use there are many types of ways for learning multiplications in a mechanical format on paper so we can do it visually with the abstract figures. What we need to do is learn the different ways, not just the one way that is generally taught. We need to learn several ways, the box method, the square method, etc, etc, and find the one that the child can relate to best. When we're doing multiplication and division, before we think about doing it in our heads, we've done the times tables on our fingers, not in our heads. So when we start doing this, we're going to go directly to paper. Once we've mastered it on paper, we then use our imagination to visualize the piece of paper in our head, and we literally work it out on the paper in our minds. This is how we get to the mental maths. When we're doing long multiplication and long division, whichever style we are using, when we go to do the multiplication, we're going to write out what we put on our fingers. We're going to write out the numbers. So if we're doing 24 times 13, we're going to write out on the side of the paper the three times table, or the answers, three, six, nine, twelve, etc. And we're going to write out the tens. 
So when going into the long multiplication, we write it out, we see it visually, and all we have to do is count the 1, 2, 3, so it's if it's 24 times 13, using the mechanics, whichever mechanics they like best, what we're going to have on the paper. Three times table, we've got to do three times four. So we count four down, there's the answer. We mark it in. With division, we're going to do exactly the same thing. So if we have, let's say, 242 divided by nine, we're going to write down 9, 18, 27, 36, all the way down. So then, when we get into the mechanics of it, and we say 9 doesn't go into 2, 9 goes into 24, how many times? We can go to what we've re written down, and we can see, and we can count how many, and write the number in. Everything is on the piece of paper. All the working in the minutest detail is there. Also, with division, when we start to get more complicated, some people I know don't like it, but the clearest way to do it is with long division. Now, I could go into the very specific mechanics of how to do multiplication, how to do division, how to do additions of long sums, but there's so much information already online. And the one I highly recommend when it comes to maths is, of course, Khan Academy. Get the children to watch their videos, they're in bright colours, they're highly visual, the explanations are brilliant. Get them to use Khan Academy or something like it and they can watch it as many times and answer as many questions as they need. If they are not understanding the methods of the calculation and you tried, for example, the multiplication, the standard mechanics, the box method, etc etc and it's not working or we're already at that stage it's an older child and we're already at that stage and they're not getting it in my experience it all comes back to that original coding so therefore we must go back and work that original coding right from the basics and then catch all the way up to where we are in maths now when we're doing the mechanical processes. It is very typical that teachers will give 20 sums that they have to work out. We as hunters can have big problems having to do 20 sums. Now sums, when they're given the 20 of them to do, nearly always the first one is the easiest, the last one is the hardest. So what we want to do is we want to do the first one. If they get the first one right, we do the one in the middle, number 15 let's say. And then if they get that right, we do the last one. In this case, it would be number 30. If they get those three right, the exercise is done. They have understood what they're doing. We don't do all 20 or 30, because as we're going through them, concentration wanes, confusion sets in, mistakes get made. And at the end of the day, we can actually end up knowing less because of tiredness or confusion by the time we get to the end than we did at the beginning. If Number one wasn't done right, that's fine, we go to number two. As soon as they get number two or number three or number four right, we jump to the middle. If they get the middle one wrong, we go back one or back two, however many we need. Once we've got that, we jump to the hard one, go back one or two as we need. But out of the 30, the aim is to not do more than maybe six, seven or eight sums or calculations maximum. Now we've seen the ABCs, the basic mathematical skills. The first skill we're going to look at can be used similar to the lazy eights and the cross crawls before that we saw earlier as simply a stimulation exercise, a break, a game. However, I've included it here because it is also a very useful skill to do when having to learn certain topics. So if we're learning spellings or we're 
trying to control our addition or our subtraction or we're trying to now multiply and divide mentally. This is a great tool to use whilst we are actually doing these things at the same time. This tool will help because we are having to consciously concentrate on arrows and movement, the spelling and the maths and any other thing we can imagine to use it for. It will help the information go straight into the subconscious. So how do we do this? First of all, we start with horizontal and vertical lines, looking up, looking down, and looking left and looking right. Once the child can control all of these very easily, we then put in our hands and we move our hands pointing up with our arms stretched out, pointing down, pointing left, pointing right, at the same time as our eyes. Then we can move our hands and our eyes in opposite directions. So perhaps the eyes go with the arrows and the arms go against the arrows and then swap it round. When we can do this really well, we can then add in the diagonals as well. Once we can do this skill fairly easily, we can then use it to add in whilst doing spelling, etc. For ADHDers, I've found an added bonus of if we do this while jumping on a trampoline. So have a go at this skill with your children, learn it, and then use it when we need to learn certain things that they find more challenging. How powerful is a visual memory? This tool has wielded some amazing results for children who believe they have a poor or bad memory. We're going to look at a list of 20 random words and you're going to look at them. You're going to have a certain amount of time to remember them. And then you're gonna to have to write them down and we'll see how many you got right. And then we'll go through how to learn these visually and we will see how powerful it can be. And I hope you test this on your children. I have had some ADDers, ADHDers, dyslexic children who truly believe they had a really poor memory. They went through these lists once with me. They did not see this list at home because I instructed the parents not to mention it for three to six months. And then I tested them again. And they could find, using visual memory, all 20 words. I have actually contacted old students from years previously and asked them if they still remembered the words years later. And they did. So this can be a very powerful tool. While this is only an exercise, you can use your imagination and see how we can further it. However, we will look at some more tasks where we can start to apply this. So without further ado, here are the words. Have a look at them. You've got two minutes to learn them. Then you're going to write them down and then we'll go through it and see how you did.
Time's up. Now please try and write down all the words you can remember. Doesn't matter how many you remember, it's just an exercise. Press pause on this video until you've written them down, then press play again. So how many did you get right? If you got over nine or ten right, you're doing very well. If you're the one in the million that got all 20, that's fabulous. But you have to have got the 20 in order. So how do we go about learning these random yet visual words in order, quickly, easily, and to put it into our long-term memory? What we're going to do is we're going to combine all these words into images to unite them. So we start with a mobile phone or a cell phone in our hands, and we're trying to give a friend a call. However, instead of trying to dial with our fingers, we have a banana in our hands, and we're trying to mark the telephone number with the banana. Erase the image. Now we have a koala cooking bananas on a barbecue. Erase the image. You're wearing a dress, and it has a zip at the back, and there's no one to help you. And along comes a friendly koala and helps you zip up the dress. Erase the image. We have a book. It's a very old fashioned style book. And this book contains every single type of zip that has ever existed in history within it. Hundreds and thousands of zips, and it even has a zip as a fastener. Erase the image. Your very friendly brother decided to take your favorite book and put lettuce leaves in between the pages. And so now your book has been rotted as the lettuce rotted and it's all black and gooey and yucky. Erase the image. We're going to an art exhibition and the special thing that everybody wants to see is a lettuce. And it is a lettuce made of glass. Erase the image. There is a tiny kangaroo in a glass. It's a wine glass. And so, this tiny kangaroo is completely drunk. You're lying down, and on your tummy, there is a little purple kangaroo jumping around, boing, 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 tickling your tummy. There is a pregnant lady, and she has a giant tummy, and she is sitting in the cold, and her tummy is getting cold. So she takes some cardboard, and she covers her tummy with the cardboard. There's a boat. It's a brand new boat. They're just launching it into the water. People are celebrating, people are partying, and this boat zooms down the launcher into the water and immediately starts to sink because it's made of cardboard. It's Christmas time. And so you put your decorations on your Christmas tree. However, instead of your regular decorations, Every single one is a tiny little boat. It's Christmas time, and you're in the Northern Hemisphere, and it's very cold, and there's snow all around. So you go outside and go for a walk, and you see a runner running down the street with no clothes on. There's a runner, and he's just won a competition. And so he stands up to receive his medal. But instead of giving him a medal, he gets given an old padlock. There's a man who's desperate to go for the toilet. He's jumping up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And there's a toilet inside a tent. But there is a giant padlock on the tent. And so he can't get in. There's a baby in a tent. It's a very, 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 very big baby and a very, 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 very small tent. There's a baby, and he's eating tomatoes. He's sitting in the middle of the floor, eating tomatoes. He's covered in red. He's eaten so many, he's sticky. It's all in his hair, it's all around him, all on the floor, covered in red. It's time to go to bed. So you pick up your tomato, you put it in your bed, and you read it. A nighttime story. You decide it's time to change the colour of the sheets and the duvet on your bed. So you take a brush 
and you paint your sheets and your duvet and all of your bed a different colour. You want to eat an almond, so you get an almond out. But it's in the shell, and you don't have a nutcracker. So you get a paintbrush, and you start whacking it as hard as you can with a paintbrush to see if you can open the almond. Now, with these images, let's see, going through one by one, not trying to remember the words, just remembering the images to connect through. If you find you do get stuck on one of them, that's fine. Jump to another word you remember and work back up the list until you connect the images. Once you've managed to go all the way through, try going backwards. So now, take a moment, get the images and write them down again. If you haven't finished, stop the video here and relax and write down the list. And then when you've finished it, press play again. So how did you do? Did you get all 20? Most people will have got all 20. They will can do it forwards and backwards very, very easily. Just by concentrating, not on the word, on those images we formed. Taking the 20 words to the next level, we're going to look at learning the countries that are round the edges of Europe. Then with this, I'm going to leave you to do the same thing with the interior countries and see how you do. So we're going to start at the top, Iceland, and then we're going to go Norway, Sweden, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, Greece, Albania, Montenegro, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Croatia, Slovenia, Italy, Spain, Portugal, France, United Kingdom, and Ireland. And we're also going to put in Malta. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to give each of the countries its own visual word. Now these words can work for me personally because I can create with the words I've used very visual images. Some of them might not be as useful to other people. It just depends on the person. If they're not useful, then we just simply have to use different words and create different pictures. So, Iceland becomes ice, Norway becomes north because of the relationship between the words. Sweden becomes south, N and S. Finland becomes fin or end. We could also use the fin of a shark here, but I chose to use end. Estonia becomes stones, Latvia, I use via, Lithuania, lithium batteries, Belarus, Bella from the movie Beauty and the Beast, Ukraine is a crane, Moldova is Maldi, Romania are Romans, Bulgaria is Volga, Turkey stays Turkey, Greece becomes great, Albania becomes albatross, Montenegro becomes black mountain, Monte mountain, Negro, black. Bosnia, Herzegovina becomes bumps and hurt. Croatia becomes crows. Slovenia becomes slow. Italy becomes a boot. Now I've changed here from going to similar words to what it looks like because Italy is a football boot kicking a ball and the ball is Spain. Portugal becomes port. France becomes fried. And we can remember French fries if we want. French fries France. United Kingdom becomes kings and Ireland becomes iron. And then Malta, because we make beer out of malt, becomes beer. So now we go back to the top and we string these into sentences of sequences. Ideally, we never go over the maximum sequence that a child can do. So if their maximum sequencing that we talked about before is seven, we're never going to go over seven. So my first image, ice from the north to the south until the end. Next image. Stones charged via lithium batteries are given to Bella from Beauty and the Beast, who is sitting on a crane. The next image. Mouldy Romans are vulgar when eating turkey. Image four. Great albatrosses sitting 
on the black mountain bump and hurt the crows. Image five. The slow boot kicks the ball to the port when fried kings iron. But never forget daddy's beer down below. Now you will see we have all the countries put in there. So now we just have to remember the images we created and how they relate back to the countries. With practice, this can become a very, very useful little tool. As an exercise, look at the interior countries and try and do the same thing. If your sequencing is nine or 10, you can do them all in one go probably. If you're more comfortable at sequencing with three or four, that's fine. We can use anything we like. So Poland can become a pole. Denmark, due to the Danish, it can become a Danish or it can become bacon. Imagination is the key to success when doing these types of things. So have a go and see how it works out. Drawing and writing. Not just writing, drawing and writing. Dyslexia, ADHDers, especially people doing dysgraphia and dyspraxia. A lot of us tend to have very bad handwriting. How do we get around this? Or how do we learn to improve it? First of all, no biros, no rollerball pens, nothing of this type. We use pencils, automatic pencils, felt tips, and fountain pens. Why is this? Because biros and bics and rollerballs, they move very quickly on the page and so they're much harder to control. Therefore, the others are better. For children that press too hard in pencil, an automatic pencil keeps breaking, so it's good to help them in that respect to press less. However, it can get very annoying. So what we can do, we can go to, instead of an HB pencil, we can go to a B pencil because they don't have to press as hard to see it. If the problem is, that they make a mess with pencil, they're rubbing it all over the place with their hands as they're going through, go the opposite way. Go to an H or even a 2H pencil because that's much harder to make a mess of. So how do we go about learning to write? Well, first of all, we learn to write without writing. We draw. We start with a big format, big piece of paper at home, and we start drawing parallel lines, straight parallel lines, horizontally and vertically. We do not move on to the next stage until they can draw parallel lines horizontally and vertically well, in big format. Once they can do this, we then want to go into intersecting lines. Once they can do this, we go to rectangles, squares, triangles, circles, all the two-dimensional shapes still in the big format. When they can do this, we can then start reducing the slides slightly. We're still in the big format but we're going down and down and down and down. And we're down to about this size. We can then introduce something that I call clouds and sheep. Doing five or six of these every single day, five clouds and five sheep every single day, will greatly help with the dexterity, matricity, or the dexterity of the fingers. As they improve, we keep going down. We can start introducing individual letters. Obviously, we've done it all in plasticine. They know how to create them by now. And we can go doing the letters still in this big format, about this size. And we go down and down and down and down and down. We go to an A4 piece of paper or an A5 piece of paper until we get down to the regular required size. Still doing the triangles, still doing the rectangles, still doing the circles and the letters. There are countries that still insist on joined up writing. Now, you may like joined up writing, you may not. But if you pay attention to Adults, the vast majority of people, do not use joined up writing anymore. So if your child has bad handwriting and they are struggling with joined up writing, it's a matter of talking to the teacher and explaining this fact. Some will accept it willingly, others are more traditional and they'll put up a bit of a fight. It's not the teacher who is in charge of your child's long-term well-being. It's you. You're the expert. If you say they don't need to do join net writing, they don't need to do join net writing, and you just have to make it clear to your child. 
I recommend, if they're struggling with joint net writing, get rid of it. If they're a child that really enjoys it, then obviously keep them going with it. Now another thing, this is called drawing and writing. A lot of children, I find, when they're writing the letters struggle, and by simply changing one little word in our vocabulary, and ask them, instead of to write the letters, to draw the letters, makes a huge difference to them. If they're struggling, try this. I'm not saying it's guaranteed to work, but with a lot of children, it does help them. So we go from the big format down to the small format, and over time, we will see great improvements following this system. Now, I also mentioned drawing. A picture paints a thousand words. Please take, if they don't have it at school, take your children to drawing class. If we later on have to take long notes and we still find writing a struggle, but we have the ability to make very quick, accurate sketches, it can take down our note-taking time a long way. So let's take biology for example, let's take science. We have to learn the heart. I'm not talking about the child needs to be able to draw in high detail a beautiful image as if like life of a heart. If they can do it and love it, great. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a sketch that is accurate to the detail they need. And if they can sketch it like this, all the labeling isn't going to be needed. It's going to need some labeling, but far less. If they can draw it accurately on paper, they can see it in their minds. If they can see it in their minds, they've learned the information. All they have to do is add a couple of names to it, which using the other techniques, word association, etc., etc., for visual stimulation, we can get that drawing pictures is worth okay, maybe not a thousand words but it's definitely worth a hundred please make sure your children learn to draw if they're older and they're already at that point it's never too late to start drawing highly highly important for hunters to draw Learning dates and numbers. Now, we mentioned this way back earlier in the course, and we're finally getting to see how to learn numbers and things like dates for history. Now, this is a quite complex system. It is very useful when we go step by step and mastering it. I'm going to give you the examples that I personally use, and then you can adapt to however you want. So we have to start with the numbers 0 to 9. Now we can use this system all the way up if we need lots of numbers, up to 100, up to 1000, however many we want. But we don't need to go any further than 9 because obviously from 0 to 9 all the other numbers are made up from these. So we have the numbers 0 through 9. We assign each number a letter. Now these letters cannot be vowels and they cannot obviously repeat. To each number we assign first a letter. Once we have assigned the letter, we then have to learn the letters through short, frequent, constant practice until we have understood them and mastered them. Then, using that letter, we assign an image to the letter and therefore to the number. We then practice this over and over very frequently in those lost times or when we need to change the subject doing homework, we can practice these. When we have these, very very clear we can then start applying them to dates to telephone numbers i find a very good exercise for our children especially young children if they do not know your cell or mobile telephone number if they don't know the house telephone number this is a great way to get them learning this system is by learning mummy and daddy and grandpa and grandma's telephone numbers so, to the number zero, I assign Z or S. Zero, Z. Number one, L, because it looks like it. Number two, N, because the N has two little feet. Therefore, number three, M, 
it has three feet. Four or ah. Five f or h. Six b or d because it looks like it. Seven t because it looks like it. Eight because eight has got the g h t in it. I use any combination of those awkward sounds c h s h g h t but not including i n g and then number nine p or q because it looks like it the zero we said z or s but not at the end of the word because so many words end in s and when we make sentences we're going to put s's on to make sense and therefore it doesn't count at the end of the word zero z zoo one l lu two n ni 3m moo, therefore my image is a cow. 4r roo, from kangaroo, my image is roo, from Winnie the Pooh. 5fvh, hive. 6b, b, 7t, t. 8, shoe is my image. 9, poo. Now this can be Winnie the Pooh or it can be a dog poo. Dog poo tends to work better for when we're making images. So if you can clearly see my images and my letters, you're free to use mine. If you prefer to make your own, even better. Because we're going to be making words with these letters, try not to use ones that are really difficult to use. For example, with number five, I have F, V, or H. V is very difficult to make words with, but sometimes is useful. So how do we go about this? Once we've mastered this, we then take, for example, a date that we have to learn in history. I've taken a random date, I don't know whether it's associated to anything or not. I took the 15th of May, 1863. So we transfer this into numbers. 15, 5, 18, 6, 3. So my letters become L, F, F, L, C, H, S, H, whatever, B or D and M. Now, when we're starting to do this, we could use, instead of the letters, the images. But what I'm going to do with the letters for large dates is just create other images out of the letters. So the 15th of May, 1863, becomes life, LF, flings, FL, a chicks, as in chicken, a chicks, bomb. Now, we could say bomb ends in B. But I'm only interested in the sound. As you can see from my number two, I chose ni, which starts with a K. But because it's silent, it doesn't matter to me. We're talking about what we can hear and what we can see. So the 15th of May, 1863 becomes life flings a chick's bomb. So now what we want to do is make, with that, a very silly image of life flinging the bomb of a baby chicken. If we were to do a telephone number, for example, I've taken any random number, 72952892, which becomes T, N, P, H, N, then the combination letters, P, N. So this becomes two new pooing hens chop knees. That's a very silly image, and the sillier the image, the more likely we are going to remember it. So for the telephone number, we create a good image in our head, and for the dates, we create that image, and then in our notes, we would actually draw something in our notes to remind us of what we're doing. So we can remember the image and therefore the words. So then from the image, we get the sentence. From the sentence, we work backwards for the date. L, F, I, L, L, F, F, L, B M. Now there is one little thing, if you notice, in Life Flings, I've marked the N in red. Technically, I shouldn't be using an N there because it can create confusion. However, as I've said, I'm not including ing into anything, and therefore it's valid. This is how you can see every image has to be carefully thought out, and the words using our imagination to create these funny images have to be thought out quite carefully. The more we practice this, the easier it becomes. 
So start with the numbers, then the letters, then the images. And if we're trying to remember just very simple numbers, then obviously we can just use those fast images that we've created. And when we're short on imagination, we can use them too. So for anywhere we see a Z in a sentence, we can just whack in the picture of a zoo. So start to practice this with your children, with the numbers, then the letters, then the images, and then we can apply it in longer situations. When studying history and lots of dates, which for many dyslexics is an absolute nightmare, if we use this and turn dates into a simple image which reminds us of a great image which reminds us of the sentence, then we can pull out the letters and turn it into numbers and turn those numbers into dates. This does seem quite a long winded way to do things, but in fact, with practice, it becomes extremely quick to do, mainly practicing the use of our imaginations. It's also good to help us practice our imagination. And so in our notes, we can then have lots of images for the dates and we can remember them. How to write an essay, or how to write anything for that matter, when we are visual people, we find this very difficult at times. So how do we go about structuring this to turn it into something very simple to do, so it requires the minimum effort when we actually come to writing? Well, here's how we get ideas for whatever we're writing. And we write them down, a single word or a little picture, randomly around wherever they are. So we have one idea, two ideas, three ideas, four ideas, five ideas, six, seven, and eight. But we got seven and eight before we got six, that's absolutely fine, so we just write them down. It's something we remembered afterwards, that's fine. So then we get our title from these eight ideas. For example, we then organize our ideas into like a storyboard going from one through to eight. And again, these can be literally a storyboard pictures, or they can be one words, or they can be a simple word or a simple phrase. Then from each of these ideas, we want to get images or single words or short phrases. We want to get, if we are, let's say, a person who does good sequences of six, we want to find a sequence of six, five or six for each one. We're going to think of three, four, five, six things in order to put underneath, to give us sentences. Now they might not come out in order and that's fine. We then, similarly as what we did above, we organize them afterwards. Once we've got these five or six images or words or phrases, we then do the same for number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight. Now, all we have to do is turn image number one of idea number one into a single sentence. And then we do the same for the second one and the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one and the sixth one and so on and so on and so on. And very quickly, we have, if we have eight ideas, we have six sequenced images or sentences for each one, we have 48 sentences ready to be written very simply. No effort in this now, we just have to write them out and we're done. With older children, from each image we might get two, three or four sentences and that's great. So if we've got five sentences from each of the little images, we've now got over 200 sentences. Well that's 2,000 words. This is how we can write essays effortlessly and linearly from our sporadic visual thinking. Note taking. When I was at university, I would be in a history of art class and I would take notes. And my friend sitting next to me would obviously also be taking notes. 
Now she was one of these people that had the ability to write down every single word the teacher said. So her notes, everybody asked for her notes when it came to revision time. 30 sides of her notes equated to my measly half to one side of an A4 piece of paper. Now, when it came to study time, obviously, she would photocopy her notes and give them out to everybody. She was a nice person. But I would take her notes and I'd read them, and I'd waste so much time reading her notes. And then I'd compare them to my notes. And whilst I was missing a little bit of information from mine, but we're talking a tiny, one or two tiny details, I would have on my one side virtually all the information she had on her 30 sides. Now, how did I do this? I hadn't learnt all the skills that I discovered later on when I was doing all my research into hunters. But I had already, for myself, discovered a way to make notes. Well, my notes were something like, I hope you're understanding my eye movements. Now, we talked about way earlier eye patterns. Where's my visual construct and where's my visual recall? I would make something sort of along the lines of what we know and understand as a mind map. Now I have looked at mind maps and I've studied mind maps. I know they're very good for some people, but they just don't work for me. They're too messy, there's too much information in them. What I've discovered is we do use a piece of paper and we put if possible, little sketches, little drawings, one words, very similar to mind maps. We use lots of colors, very similar to mind maps. However, for younger children, each page can only have one sequence worth of information. If their sequencing is eight, we have eight pieces of information. Eight stimuli. So whilst we only have eight bits of information on the page, if their sequencing is 14, then we can have 14. If their sequencing is five, then we can have five. For slightly older kids, we can do two sequences on a page, one and two. And then sometimes they might intermix if that is relevant. We don't put more on for the simple fact we want it clear and we're trying to literally create an image in our mind of what we have on the paper. If it's full of information and full of details, our brain just can't handle all that information. That's why we keep it to one or two sequences. Otherwise, they're very similar to mind maps. We don't have to have the information, the main bit in the center of the page, and then we spiral outwards. For me, I tend to prefer to have my titles, normally titles or main drawings, spread around. I find if I'm using the main piece of information is a drawing, I tend to find it better having it somewhere down the bottom of the page and going up. If I don't have the time to draw what I need to draw and I'm using a word instead, I tend to find putting the title words up the top of the piece of paper. Now, I'm not saying this is the system for everybody because I've seen people put it in different places. What I'm saying is the child chooses where they like to see it, where they feel it nice and comfortable and calm, that's where they put it. You'll find left-handers are going to go to one side of the page and right-handers are going to go to another. You're going to find people who are educated in Japan through the reasons of Asian art versus Western art. The way we weigh the images, one's going to go one side, one's going to go the other side. This isn't important. What is important is it feels comfortable per the, to the person making the study pattern. Now, if we're taking notes in class, pictorially, we might have more than seven bits of information or one sequence on a page, and that's absolutely fine. But when it comes to revision study for exams, we're then gonna take those and develop them into one sequence or maximum two sequences per page to then create an image of that. Now these images, or single words, and I do stress single words over phrases because whilst phrases are fine, it's very quickly that phrases of two words turn into five words, turn into seven words, and that's a no. We don't want anything lineal either. It's gotta be around, it's gotta be how we see stuff in our head. 
We see visions and images even behind us. Obviously on paper we can't do that, but it doesn't have to seem to you to have any logic as long as it does to the child. When we study, we take the maybe 20 pieces of information that we sketch down in class and we transfer it to individual sequences or double sequences per page, lots of bright colors. We might improve those drawings a bit and each of those drawings is to stimulate a memory. So when I was taking notes, I might have a little key drawing, but that little key drawing didn't represent one word. It represented perhaps a whole paragraph or some a movie that I had created in my mind by listening to the teacher. As she was talking, I would be sitting, not quite in the learning state because I hadn't realized what it was then, but something similar. I'd already worked a lot of these sort of things out by myself without knowing it. I'd be sitting there relaxing and I would be turning the information she said into a movie in my mind. And then at key points, I would jot down a little drawing or a little sketch or a little word with different colors. Yeah, my table was a mess. I had colors everywhere. Didn't matter. It was useful to me to remember that section of the movie. This is how we create very powerful notes. It takes practice like all the other skills we're talking about. It has to make sense to the child. The child most likely isn't going to know at the beginning. So it especially depending on the age, so it is going to be a little bit of trial and error. But that's how we take notes. With note taking, paper or computer. Now I know there's lots of talk with dyslexics and ADHDs, it's far better to use computers in the classroom. Well, no. Whilst it is useful because we can quickly look up extra information and copy and paste and things like that, it's also been proven that when we're taking notes, if we know how to draw in pictorial format very quickly, it has been proven that writing something down or creating something by hand is committed to memory far better than if we're typing it or copying and pasting stuff on a computer. So using paper for note taking is always going to be far more powerful than using a, a computer. If we're not using the pictorial note-taking method and the child is a very slow writer, then yes, because we can use a speech-to-text app and we can focus it at the teacher or the lecturer and the computer can literally be recording it down for us or we can be recording it auditorily and pretending to type so we can type it out later. There are many tools we can use with computers. We can do this with MP3 players and mobile phones as well. Or we can just learn to type very quickly and type it in. But this is not going to be as powerful as if we learn to do it the other method. Making movies in our brains, sketching images very quickly on paper. You're going to see a quick example of what I mean by quick sketches. I've done this on the computer. Not for the reason of computer, or hand, just as a pictorial representation of how to record details quickly. So have a look at the video and then produce that by hand. Yes, we need to be able to draw to be able to do this quickly. Things don't have to be perfect, they just have to be understood. So here's just a very quick example of how to take visual notes, jotting things down when we've become skilled at making sketches. We can then pass it to a computer later, or if we have a computer in the classroom, then this is possible too. But it does take practice. So here we go. See if you can understand clearly from the pictures this. Richard I of England was born on the 8th of September, 1157, and he died the 6th of April, 1199. He was King of England from the 6th of July, 1189, until his death. He also ruled as the Duke of Normandy, Aquitaine, and Gascony. He was Lord of Cyprus, Count of Poitiers, Anjou. You might notice 
I've missed out one key bit of information. And that was the date he was, he was king from. So try having seen the video on dates. Try adding that in now. I'll remind you, the 6th of July, 1189. We're now onto the most complex task and skill to be developed here. We're going to start with an example that's very simple to help us remember things, as hunters tend to be very forgetful, but this is a tool that can be used and has been used for thousands of years. It said that people like Plato use these skills and the great philosophers use these skills to their advantage and to be able to do philosophy using them once they have created it up into large scales. This is using places to literally place images of our memory. So I'll give you an example. We have a child that's very forgetful and often forgets to hand their, in, their homework in at school. So we take the journey from house, from the house to the school. We start with the front door. This is our first place to put an image. We then have the path walking to the gate. That's another one. We have a plant, we have a flower, we have a tree, we have a gate outside the gate. We have another tree, we have another house, we have a pond, we have a rubbish bin, we have all these things. We might have a shop. All these things are location places to place information. So a child who forgets their homework, the first place, the front door, on the back of the door, if they're the ones that open the door. If you're the one that opens the door and they normally walk straight out, it's going to be useless putting it on the back of the door. So let's hang it in the middle of the doorway, floating in the air. We put a picture of their homework, fixed there. We then put a picture, let's say if you have a tree, of them handing the homework to the teacher or putting the homework in the place they have to put it in school. If they have to do it before rec time, before break time, play time, then on the gate, we put an image with a warning. Homework in now, homework in now, homework in now. And a little video of playtime, rec time. If they know how to use a watch, then we can put 10 o'clock. Then when we get in the car, we're not gonna put any in the car because we're in the car and we're on the way. If they're walking, then we can put a couple of more reminders down to the end of the street. When we get to the school, we can put on the school gates, on the door, on the place they put their stuff in their locker, on their classroom door, all these warnings about handing in the homework, these images. The idea of this is, if we do this, let's say the day before, the morning, when they walk through the door, their subconscious is gonna click in and say, homework. And so they're gonna remember it. It does take practice and it depends where we place the images because obviously if we place it in the tree, but in the mornings, if they're half asleep and they're walking with their head down looking at the feet and they never look at the tree the tree isn't going to help us to stimulate it so it's got to be a little bit sensible and logical how we place these things now how do we use the same technique to build up this detailed information well we do the same thing but we take let's say their favorite subject their favorite room or a room of the house so let's take maths and let's take their bedroom within maths let's take the subject of addition give the bed Addition and subtraction. Addition and subtraction are, of course, the same thing. 15 plus 20 equals 35. 35 minus 25 equals, let's read that backwards, what added to 25 is 35. Addition and subtraction are the same thing. Just like fractions and decimals are the same thing. A fraction, 1 over 4 literally means 1 divided by 4. 1 divided by 4 goes to 0 0.25 when we put it in to a division. Same thing. So we put subtraction and addition on the bed. And the teddy bear can represent the mechanics of, for example, carrying numbers. Both adding and subtracting. The pillow can represent counting in tens etc 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 and we literally place all around the room on objects the mechanics of the stuff we have to do this is not talking about original coding this is talking about the mechanics of the information we might start in the kitchen with science and so we put the heart in 
the oven and we put photosynthesis on the window and etc 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 when we've done this over time following the quadruple one rule at the end of the day we go into our room only takes a second and we check that everything is still in place and nothing's missing if something's missing if we know what it is we put it back if we understand it we put it back if not we look at our books we check and we put it back this revision can be done daily because it takes milliseconds to do for each room over time we build up so the house becomes a big science mathematical playroom. Well, as maths is the language of science, that's a good thing. We can use the neighbor's house, if your children know what the neighbor's house looks like, for another subject, and we just keep growing and growing and growing. Our street, our neighborhood, our village, our town, our city, growing and growing and growing. Now, how the old philosophers use this is they would have literally complex cities of all their memories stored in different buildings and they built it up over time so then what they said they would do when they wanted to philosophize or meditate over the information they would imagine themselves climbing up the mountain so they could see the whole city all their memories and then they could identify very clearly key parts to put together and this is how they came up with some amazing revolutionary ideas so this is a proven over hundreds and thousands of years ago this is a proven tool to be very very powerful it just sort of got forgotten by most people or never learnt by most people along the way it does take time it does take practice as soon as you can get your kids to start using it and use it yourself for remembering things if that's what you're going to use it for but if you use it to build up all the knowledge they learn in school and you take the time to do it properly and you go through it with them and revise it with them it takes far longer to revise it verbally because have you got this have you got that is it in its right place blah, blah, blah. when they get used to it as i said in their imagination go in the house go in the kitchen everything in place yes in the living room everything in place yes in the bedroom everything in place yes you will know virtually instantly if something's out of place. So you can just look at the object, see what it is. Okay, what was that? Put it there. We do not do double imposition of things. So you can't put two things that are different on the same object because that will lead to confusion. As addition and subtraction are the same thing, we can put them in the same place. Otherwise, independent things have to go in independent places. Give it a go. As we're nearing the end of the course, I wanted to just cover a few extra topics that we haven't had time for to cover in the course. One, the precursor to frustration, confusion. Do your children ever seem confused? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? What is confusion? Well, we can only be confused about something when we actually have a fair knowledge of it. If we have no knowledge about something, we can't be confused. So we have to teach our children that confusion is actually a good thing. It means we're very close to understanding what it is we actually need to learn. Now let's start putting everything together that we have learned so far in the course. We have to master the alphabet, mainly visually, obviously auditorily and kinesthetically, and the links between them, kinesthetically, so we can write it. Most people with reading challenges never actually master this. You now know how to do it. Some languages are then phonetical. So if the previous is done for those languages, then there will be few problems when it comes to reading and writing. Whereas English is only about 80% phonetical. So there's always gonna be slightly more of a challenge there. And that's where we have to go to the spelling videos and take our time and let the child's subconscious brain work out the phonetics. With visual people, teach visual reading from the beginning. Communication and teaching methods are the key. Visual, visual, visual.
from previously in the course. Little and often, stacking information, building it on each other, paying attention, stress elimination. Little and often. Interest, understanding the topic in your representation or your learning system of the world and develop your other systems in time. Imagination, critical thinking, some repetition to maintain knowledge, that's why we have the quadruple one rule. Master one thing at a time and add to it. Only add once mastered. Any new subject must be linked to an existing one to make it easier. Now one thing we can use, although we can do this visually, we can do it kinesthetically and we can do it auditorily. One thing I haven't mentioned in this course is music. To learn music can actually benefit hunters greatly. Whether we learn it visually, whether we learn it kinesthetically, or whether we learn it auditorily by listening to music, it doesn't matter how we do it. Learning musical instruments, whilst a little challenging for most hunters, can also be a great one to relieve stress, especially if we're talking about something like the drums, but another way to help us start developing our other representation or learning system. So remember, when we're doing all of this, we need to constantly be building rapport with our children. We need to develop a good personal learning environment so if the subject is not that interesting to the student, they will learn it almost just to please you. However, it's better to exude a love for that topic. Loving something is the reason to do it, isn't it? So give them that reason too. Be a great salesperson and sell them each and every individual topic. We need to stimulate the imagination and critical thinking, don't we? So the imagination, playing games, I spy, what does this cloud in the sky look like? All these games that we used to play as children that seem to have faded away. They all have lots of good reasons to play them. Chess, drafts, all these games make us think. Stratego, risk, and not on the iPad, the physical board games. Hunters need to be move around and doing things. So when we are thinking about doing any task with them or any homework, we need to design the way we're going to do it to enable this instead of just sitting at a desk with a chair. It's going to be so much easier that way. Remember when we're learning states of attention to anchor the positive ones. Remember to explain what, how, why, what if of each topic in the relevant system, mainly in our case visual. Know the representational system of your student. What do I mean by this? Know the learning style of your child. It can be your child, it can be another child. Normally we're talking about visual. Learn this through their language because they, if they are visual people, they will tend to use visual language. And obviously through their eye patterns. Use the most appropriate system to explain anything whilst watching them. And if you need to explain it in another system for any reason, that's fine too. Sometimes, if they are so built into a kinesthetic feeling about something, then use it. Remember to chunk up, down, and sideways to help the critical thinking. Teach self-discipline through self-control. And obviously lead by example. This goes back to the sport and the eating right. If you master the art of communication, watching your negative language, eliminating try, eliminating should, this will greatly increase what you can do. Now one thing we haven't really talked about is great self-esteem. Lots of hunters have very poor self-esteem. How are we going to deal with this? One thing I have mentioned is 80 to 90% easy and 20 to 10% challenge. Obviously, we praise whether they did well or not. Because if you go and play tennis and you play terribly, 
but the coach keeps on saying, you're doing great, you're doing great, you're doing great, you're doing great, in the right way, then you are going to develop a love for tennis. And you're going to get better much faster. But if someone's saying, oh, you can't do this, you're terrible, you're lazy, you're... that most certainly isn't going to develop a love for the subject or for the sport or for whatever we're doing. So remember all these things. And if we do have a child who has very poor, low self-esteem, use the 90-10 and make sure they get to do lots of other activities that they love doing, whether it's computer programming, playing basketball, let them do what they need to do. It could be photography, it could be art, it could be playing music. Let them experiment, see what they like, and then try and relate everything together when we are talking about self-esteem. Teaching that confusion is good, teaching that mistakes are good, everything together. And obviously, remember the most important thing out of all of this, the ecosystem. To conclude this course, we have, in the previous video, looked at all the things we need to remember. We need to look at our ABCs, our maths, all the skills previously seen. And now, just to finish, I would like to look at something. At the beginning, we talked about hunters and farmers. This is a very modern way to look at this. But now I want to go back much further in history and look at a much older system of representation just to put things in perspective. In ancient China, we had Taoism and we had Confucianism. Now, we're not talking about the exact philosophies of what they are, just simply how they work. Confucianism was built on a strict discipline. It was designed for farmers and Taoism, which the way they talk about it very, in a very basic manner means going with the flow, ready to change direction when needed, going down that river. When there are rapids, change your style of paddling, go with the flow. This doesn't mean to say be lazy, this means go with a goal in mind and achieve that goal, but being able to be flexible whilst we're doing it. This is the way of the hunter. So many hunters at school, when they're failing, feel they can't do things in life that others can do, because they're told a lot of the time they can't or they're struggling with reading and writing. It's just not true. So what are examples of jobs that hunters can do really well? Obviously, on the top of the list for hunters, the jobs is entrepreneur. It's, it's got to be there, number one. But because we're highly visual, any other visual skill we can do really well. Architect, engineer, and then those high stress, but not negative stress, positive stress jobs, we can also do really well because hunters react well to those positive stresses like pilot, like an emergency or surgical doctor, like a soldier, like atypical teachers, programmers, designers. Hunters are great at anything that's sports related, art related, and obviously there are so many, many more. There are some jobs that hunters just aren't gonna want to do, but there are many that are perfect for us. So to close this course, let's have a look at one of my favorite topics. The Hunter Club. Who's in our club? Well, we have people like Edison, Churchill, Da Vinci, Washington, Einstein, Picasso, Disney, Richard Branson, Michael Jordan, Emily Dickinson, Steven Spielberg, Tom Cruise, and many, 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 many more. Top bankers, top executives, all over the place. That's a nice club to be in, don't you think? We're finally at the end of the course. I hope you have enjoyed the process with me, learning lots, finding lots of helpful information, 
And if there's anything else you think you would like me to add to this course, or in fact do another course about, please contact me and please let me know and I will do my very best to create those courses or videos to add to this course for you. If you have enjoyed this course and have learnt lots on this course and found the information really useful, then please review this course and give it a good rating with your honest comments about it. Thank you very much and I hope to see you again in the future and possibly talk to you on private messaging.